Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lubkeman, and welcome to the dialogue with Siddhartha Mishra, who is professor at ETH Zurich, and head of the Mathematics Laboratory in the Department of Mathematics, and also an associated faculty member of the AI Center. This dialogue, which we're about to have, is part of the AI Plus X series, which is a collaboration between the Strategic Foresight Hub, which I lead, and the AI Center. The series consists of three components. The first is a spotlight video of the faculty member on their research, which is actually really quite interesting, and SIDS is up already on the AI Center YouTube channel. And then there was a, a lab where... Those who participate are able to dig deeper into the meaning of the dialogue and the potential of AI with the faculty member and their domain. And then finally, a dialogue with me, where we get to kind of play and have a bit of a conversation about what it is and where this world is heading. So here we go. Sid, welcome. It's great to see you. Thanks, Chris, and also thanks for having me today. It is, it's truly really, it's really a pleasure. So um, very, very first question for me is, what is applied math? Because <laughs> I know what math is, but, you know, one, two, three, but what's applied math? Yeah, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, there's no precise definition. It is, it's strange coming from a mathematician, right? We believe in things being very precisely defined. <laughs> but applied math is something that is uh, very difficult to define uh, sort of in a precise manner. But loosely speaking, it's uh, mathematics. It's still mathematics. But with the, the whole objective of the mathematical exercise or the mathematical uh, development is to apply it in the context of some scientific problem, in the context of some engineering problem or social problem. In principle, mathematics can be done for its own sake, right? You take numbers, for instance, prime numbers, and you want to find properties of prime numbers. No one cares where they are useful or whether they are useful or not. Oh, and maybe cryptogra cryptography, they care. Later on, right? Yeah, and okay. That's the point. <laughs> the mathematics by itself can be, mathematical structures are so beautiful that you can spend your entire lifetime thousands or hundreds of thousands of people can spend their entire lifetimes exploring the beauty of these structures. The difference between an applied mathematician and a mathematician who is not necessarily applied is, for an applied mathematician, the perspective is, uh, so of course, as you said, prime numbers could be used in cryptography and so on. However, the distribution of prime numbers, the people who studied it, they didn't think about it. They didn't think about the fact that they are going to use it for cryptography and so on. Mm -hmm. An yeah. applied mathematician is someone who does his mathematical work with a mission and a mission. A vision is to apply it in some concrete situation. So that's ah. the difference. So it's, uh, it's uh, when exactly do you expect what you're doing to be useful and what motivates you? Interesting. So it's not just the intrinsic mathematical properties that interest you. It's the fact that you are going to use this mathematics, I don't know, to predict the weather or to simulate the climate or whatever. So these are yeah. sort of the, so it's a difference in motivation and it's a difference in, let's say, the time perspective, how long it's going to take to make an impact. A non-applied mathematician doesn't care about the time perspective for an applied mathematician that's central. Interesting. So when when did... Where did it apply? If I, sorry, let's start differently. So if I think back to space and when the space race was going or like that seems to me a good use of applied mathematics, trying to figure out the ballistics formula and where you're going to be and astrophysics. So has applied math been around forever? We just haven't called it that? Or is it something which is in just... The in the beginning, math was mostly applied math. <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a classic example is, of course, Newton trying to build calculus. The reason why I wanted to build calculus is, of course, to codify his uh, theories of gravitation, to compute yeah. things, to calculate if you throw a ball, where does it land and things like that. Right. So yeah. Newton would be a prototypical applied mathematician. Actually, every mathematician at that time was an applied mathematician. It's only later on that uh, mathematics, uh, just for its own sake, became more, uh, let's say, prevalent. But uh, the math uh, mathematics is applied, math <laughs> applied yeah. mathematics. And anyway, as I said, the demarcation between applied and non-applied mathematics is not very sharp. 
Okay. So yeah. Newton would be a classic example of an applied mathematician. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I, I love that the idea of you saying is that my, like I, I'm feeling as I listen to you and I watch you, you get really excited about this idea. I can apply what I've learned to to do something. So, what are some? Give me an example or two of some of the things that you you're applying mm -hmm. your math. What? what? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, many many different things. So. Okay. Uh, maybe the most, um, a lot of it has been uh, sort of applying things in the context of astrophysics. Uh, so in astrophysics, okay. you have uh, all kinds. So let's take a very simple example, the sun itself, right? So the nearest star, our only star. And, uh, you know, trying to understand things in the sun requires understanding a lot of different physical processes. So, you know, there's convection, there is radiation, there is magnetism, there are very complex nonlinear interactions between these things. Now, if you want to understand the sun, for instance, if you want to understand concrete questions in the sun about the temperature distribution in the sun, for instance, then you, you can't just do it by in words, right? You have, to, you have to be very precise in what you mean by that. And then the math comes in. So you write down this, all these phenomena that I just described, convection, conduction, radiation, and so on, all of them transport, you write them down in terms of mathematical objects, and these mathematical objects are what are called partial differential equations. And then you get uh, this mathematical formulation of, let's say, the dynamics of the sun. Now you want to, you can't, so in order to do anything useful, in order to predict things, or so in order to sort of um, compare with measurements, observations, you need to solve these equations. And this is not possible by hand. And this is where you try to solve them on a computer. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, bulk of the computing work in the world, at least at the level of very large scale computing, takes uh, solves these kind of problems in astrophysics, in climate science, molecular dynamics, chemistry, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the world's computing power goes into solving these kind of problems. And then using that, you see whether your predictions, your physical predictions, your model predictions agree with observations, and if you can discover new phenomena, if you can answer interesting questions. So astrophysics, whether it's uh, sort of sun, properties of the sun, whether it is star formation, there are different kinds, supernova explosions. I've worked on problems like that. Uh, so this, this is one concrete forum where one can apply the sort of algorithms, the tools that we develop and so on. But there are many others, engineering, um, aerospace engineering in particular, but other forms of engineering, climate science, you name it, geophysics, there are, there are various different, because it so happens that the basic phenomena, the building blocks are very similar. So the equations describing them happen to be very similar. And then hmm. since we deal with the equations, we have a much broader perspective. The same equations yeah. are there in the sun as they are on the earth, you know, at least hmm. uh, some of the scales could be different. But uh, so there is, a, there is a wider perspective from which you can attack different problems at the same go. That's, that's actually really qu pretty cool. I kind of wish I had had you as my teacher <laughs> back at university when I did not do so well in my math classes. But um, I want to remind everybody who is, who's, who's tuned in, you are very, very welcome to put a question into the Q&A bubbles, and I will do my very, very best to pull them and present them to Sid for his... Uh, for his perusal and attempt to answer your hard questions. Just don't ask about the meaning of zero or something like that. I think we can, <laughs> we can do that. So, so Sid, when we think about applied math, do, do, do the problems come to you or do you go to them? It's a very, very good question. It's, it's a mix. It's, it's a mm. mix. And uh, at least from my own personal perspective, it has always been a mix. Uh, so mm. many times what happens is that the problems come to you. Someone tells, okay, can you, can you look at this? So this is my problem. Can you help me with this? You know? So to give you a concrete example, we had a professor of um, 
climate science, climate dynamics some years back at ETH, uh, Tapio Schneider, he went back to Caltech, so he's no longer with us. Uh, so he was interested in simulating clouds and he was struggling to simulate clouds and uh, hmm. struggling, but they were not as uh, they, they were not as accurate the simulations as they wanted to be. And one day we just met in actually a faculty hiring committee and he said, oh, you know what, uh, we are sort of struggling to model these clouds. Why don't you come over and we talk to you and explain to you what the problems are. And then, of course, I we went and I listened to him. And then eventually, after several years of collaborations, we did manage to improve his predictions considerably. Hmm. Here's a question. Here is an example of the problem coming to me. But the same tools that we developed uh, while solving that problem are useful in some other contexts. So I could easily go over to another colleague who comes from some other part of engineering, you know, and not from climate science. And I say, oh, I have this cool tool now. Why don't you guys use it? So there's a constant dialogue between uh, between me and my interlocutors, as it were, from the sciences and from engineering. And uh, many times it's it's a mixture. So there is no mm-hmm. clear cut. Uh, you know, uh, okay, you always solve problems that other people you know, other people give you. No, that doesn't happen. It's always a dialogue. So that's that's what makes it a lot of fun. That's really cool. I like that because. Um... And I'm just thinking to myself, as you're trying to model the dynamics of a cloud, I was thinking back to what you were just saying with the sun, mm-hmm. the dynamics of the sun. Because at the end of the day, partial differential equations is the language of dynamics. Absolutely. Time-dependent partial differential equations. Time-dependent yeah. partial. Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, partial differential equations need not, you, you can have quantities that are not time-dependent, and you can still model them as partial differential equations. Okay. The so, dynamics. Uh, so partial differential equations they explain relationships. It could yeah. be the dynamics in time, but they explain relationships between physical objects. You know, it could be it could be things like how the pressure is related to the temperature, or it could just be the simplest uh, differential equation that you can think of is an ordinary differential equation, which is Newton's law, which simply says that your acceleration, which is the second derivative of the displacement, equals the force. So that's mm-hmm. the, that's that's the let's say the genesis of differential equations was this very statement. Hmm. So Interesting. I, I presume this was the first time that someone wrote down a differential equation. Yeah, that's great. I like that. And so, how d- how did you come to this? Just give me a, a brief. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, was there this moment when you were twelve years old? You said, you know, hey, mom. <laughs> I'm going to be an applied mathematician. No, no, no. When okay. I was 12, I think I didn't tell it to my mother, but when I was 12 years old, I wanted to be a physicist, a theoretical physicist. Ah, and, okay. Uh, physics in some sense has always been my first love. So yeah. I, I I studied both physics and math uh, in my undergraduate uh, studies uh, at, equal, at equal weight. So uh, I took the same number of courses in both physics and math. But then when I came to graduate school, then one has to make a choice, right? And the, the, one of the reasons why I chose applied math is it still has a link with physics, means uh, mm-hmm. you know, sure. dealing with physical quantity, yeah. Yeah. Link with physics. And at the same time, I realized pretty early on that, uh, you know, to be a physicist, you need a lot of physical intuition. You have to think in, you know, if the temperature is high here and low there, what happens in between? Or if uh, the matter is so granular in one place and less granular in another place, what are the sort of how is the energy flowing and so on? And uh, to my consternation, I never have that intuition. I don't think like that. So even as a student, I had to look at the formulas. To uh-huh. make sense of things. So I always yeah. uh, just, this is uh, somehow it comes naturally to me to think in terms of formulas and in terms of equations. So instead of thinking if the temperature goes up and goes down, what happens to the flow? I think, okay, look at the temp- gradient of the temperature, what is proportional to the gradient of the temperature, what power is it equivalent to? So I realized uh, in graduate school that um, maybe I hmm. should stick more to the math because I simply don't have the physical intuition while at the same time trying to do something that um, is still close to physics. And this is sort of accidentally I landed up in applied math and computational math because that's what I do. But it was mostly a matter of, this is not what I thought at the age of 12, but more at what I thought at the age of 22. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's really, that's really great. Well, I think all of us are glad you did choose that, but you just said two words, which I'm intrigued by computational math. Yeah. Right. 
because I remember when I was at MIT, the mathematicians all walked around with yellow notepads and <laughs> two or three pencils. Right? I'm not kidding, actually. In the faculty, yeah. in the faculty <laughs> lunchroom, they'd sit there. And you could always tell the mathematicians because that's what they had. I'm assuming they were the theoretical ones, not the applied ones. So computational math. T tell me about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, again, it's not something that has a very precise definition. This is uh, roughly... Um, it's a study of a, not algorithms from a sort of a computer science sense, theoretical computer science sense, but for instance, a concrete example, as I said, is we have all these partial differential equations. Yeah. Uh, these need to be solved. They can't be solved in pen and paper. That's, that's the difficulty. People have tried for hundreds of years to do that, right? But they can't be solved on pen and paper. The only way we can do it is to approximate or simulate them on a computer. Hmm. And that requires algorithms that requires understand that requires, you know, that these algorithms are going to be efficient, they're going to be stable, they're going to be robust, they have the computable and so on. So a computational mathematician like me, we study such algorithms, we, we develop them, we analyze them, we implement them, we sort of check if they, you know, if they if they work in, in the real world, right? You, you check yeah. them and see if things are uh, performing and so on. So computational mathematics is uh, this mathematical study of algorithms, uh, the design analysis of algorithms to solve interesting physical problems. Okay, so comp I, I, was, I was listening to your spotlight. You talked quite a lot about got numerical cost. Yeah. And I, I was I really was intrigued because it, what I learned is a lot of what you're doing is trying to find more efficient algorithms. That so is, explain what that means and, and how you do that. That's a very, very good question. So why is efficiency so important, right? Uh, efficiency is so important because, uh, okay, here is the way it is. As I said, uh, let me try to explain this. So as I said, we are doing approximations, right? And the biggest approximation, because on a computer, you can't, uh, as an input, you can't put in anything which is continuous, you know? So you can't just put in, let's say the whole of Zurich. So you have to sample Zurich at certain discrete locations. So think of, I want to measure the temperature of all of Zurich. I can't do that, right? So I have mm -hmm. to put in measuring stations uh, all over Zurich. More number of measuring stations that I put, the better an approximation that I'm going to do to, yeah. the, uh, to, to the ground truth. Sure, yeah. Now, more number of approximations. So to approximate any system, I need uh, so discrete objects which are going to approximate the continuous object. So this, uh, the, the smallest uh, sort of scale that is there is what is called the resolution. You know, so yeah. can, for instance, uh, one kilometer resolution of measurement means I put a measurement station here at ETH. And maybe I put the next measurement station at the Bahnhof or something like that. Right. Yeah. It's a one meter resolution. I have a measuring station here and a measuring station or 10 meters in your office, right? So this is, uh, so the point is you need more and more resolution to increase accuracy, but mm. you pay for something, right? You pay in terms of now you have more operations because uh, earlier you were approximating something by, I don't know, thousand points. But now you want to approximate it by a million points. It takes uh, more computational time and resources, power, to approximate something by a million points. So it's important to be efficient in the sense that mm. if if I had all the you know if I had all the computational resources on Earth and I could uh, you know uh, you can compute anything. But this is not the case. We always have to pay a finite. You have to pay a price per sure. computational unit. Yeah. And you have to say that, okay, I always have a fixed, the, the amount of computational units available to me are increasing all the time. So yeah. yesterday I was talking to one of my students and I was saying that when I was a graduate student, the simulation that he was looking at uh, was the state of the art, means people are very happy that uh, one could resolve this. Today, he, he the reason why I said it, because he said it ran on his GPU in one minute. <laughs> and you know, so so you know, so there is a there's a Moore's law. There's an exponential growth in the computational yeah. um, units available to us. But at the same time, the problems that we're interested in get harder and harder. You know, so yeah. there, there is a race between what you want and what you have, and efficiency mm -hmm. somehow bridges that race. 
And yeah. just just to give you a point, uh, the 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 Moore's law it increases exponentially, but our algorithms are also the the software, let's say, is also sort of increasing exponentially. So it's a double exponential coming together of these two things that has made computations possible. You know, so some of the large scale computations are not just a manifestation of the fact that uh, you have better, more computing power, but because we have better algorithms. So computational That's cost true. is essential. It's a mm -hmm. very important consideration. And so I guess this is where then the parallel processing becomes mm -hmm. good because I guess the algorithm you're designing then is how to break down how to break down a calculation so that it can go into a parallel processing. Absolutely. This is For example, very, is that, yeah. this is a very important element of it. So the first yeah. step is uh, always to do it in such a manner that you can do it on a single processor, but that's not going to be very efficient because the bang for the buck, as it were, would come if you are able to distribute your job on thousands or millions of uh, processing units. And this is where a lot of the algorithmic work comes in. And uh, in my lab, we do some of that work mm -hmm. and so that we can scale to the sort of state-of-the-art supercomputing systems, which we have access to. Indeed, yeah. without, without that, it's not possible. Yeah, yeah. Some of the things so, so what are some of the most challenging problems which you're, as a mathematician, mm -hmm working on right now yeah so as a mathematician when you say then it, uh, i have to put on my mathematical hat and answer to that question so <laughs> point is some of these pdes that i just from a more let's say theoretical perspective forget the algorithms for, for a moment in fact they are very intimately connected so some of the equations that um, that are most often used in practice these equations, one of them was written down by a Swiss uh, genius, uh, Leonard Euler, you know, mm -hmm. from Basel, in 1757. These are the Euler's equations, sure. and which was further modified by two gentlemen, one French and one, Inga, one Scottish, actually, Navier and Stokes. Yeah. And these equations have been around for 250, 270 years. And yet, and they, they model everything from the flow of water in the Limat to the clouds here or to what happens in, on galaxies. You, still, we don't understand some of the very fundamental mathematical questions about, uh, and physical questions for that matter, about these equations. And hmm. uh, so one of the things that I do quite a bit, uh, which is not necessarily applied in a strict sense, is to understand the sort of basic um, phenomenology of these equations, the basic mathematical properties of these equations. And to do so, we use a lot of uh, computational work, essentially as experiments to replace yeah. them. We can't do experiments, so we replace them with computational experiments, numerical experiments. And from there, we make interesting hypotheses about uh, the physical system, which did not necessarily immediately be applied to the climate or to some other system, but in the future could be, right? Sure. So one thing that I've been interested in for the last 15, 20 years is to understand the basic properties of these equations and all the time making let's say, incremental progresses and hope eventually hoping to make that big progress, right? So from a mathematical side, this is what I am very interested in. Uh, in. Yeah. And needless to say, because these equations are so complicated, designing good algorithms for them is also extremely challenging. So, yeah. uh, so this, this goes hand in hand. Yeah. So, so then, so you are working with the AI center. Mm -hmm. So where does... AI come into this then? Yeah, so this was uh, sort of the content of my of my spotlight, right? So there are two ways in which you can think of it. So one way is that uh, AI, in particular machine learning, you know, AI is sort of a very wide, uh, very vast field, uh, sort of uh, it's a very wide scope. But within uh, that machine learning is uh, very particular. So the idea is that at the moment, uh, a lot of the algorithms that we design and which we have designed historically, they're based on the physics. It means, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you know the physics, convection, radiation, conduction, things like that. You write down these partial differential equations and then you try to find an algorithm to approximate these partial differential equations. Usually, in the traditional scheme of things, data was not uh, in the mixture, you know, because it was difficult to get data. And... Uh, Physicists did not want to sully their hands uh, by, you know, having data in addition. 
But today we know that data is there. We have lots of data. So data-driven computing is, uh, is a very important point where you combine algorithms, data, than the basic physics, you know, to make something which is much more efficient. Hmm. So in particular, what you can do is you can, uh, you have a numerical algorithm which uses the physics to simulate your system. This is expensive, but then after, uh, but it can help you generate a few training samples and using these training samples, you can use a machine learning system to make predictions. And this is something which we do quite a lot. Other people do also quite a lot these days. And uh, this gives you many orders of magnitude speed up over traditional physics-based simulations. So, you, yeah. so, so Sid, give me an example of, of, of what you mean. Make I'm, it, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to give you an example. And thank you. Yeah. So the, uh, a concrete example, for instance, could be, I think in my spotlight, I also spoke about this uh, example of tsunami simulations. Yeah, so, the way, uh, so what what does a tsunami do? You know, so what you what you or what is a tsunami? So what happens is uh, let's focus just on earthquakes. Uh, similar things happen when there are rock slides and rock falls and whatnot. But if there's an earthquake uh, in the uh, in the middle uh, in the bottom of the ocean, so what happens is that the sea floor rises. Because the yep. sea floor rises, the at the surface there is a little rise in the sea level. Because of that, a wave is generated, right? You're making the sea level rise. So a wave is going to be generated. This wave propagates. Uh, there's a lot of energy which is uh, pushed on by the wave. And when it comes to the shore, because there's a lot of energy and the shore is going to be shallower and shallower and shallower, it becomes a big tsunami wave. So that's sort of the physics or the phenomenology behind tsunamis. But in order to predict uh, uh, tsunami early warning system, what it does is that once there's an earthquake, you know, the, then the, there is an uh, uh, earthquake is ca characterized by different parameters. Now, these parameters are measured. Then there are some models which tell you how much is the lift of the sea flow. And then the partial differential equations, which are on the surface of the ocean, there are something called shallow water equations. They, these are solved, uh, simulated on a computer. And then predictions are made about what is going to be the height of the wave or what is going to be the arrival time at different mm. locations, you know. And based on that, the tsunami warning is issued. Now, this all sounds good, but the point is that there is a, this is where the cost comes in. So in, the, in this, even the state of the art uh, today, it takes approximately one hour of simulation time um, on the state of the art systems to make these predictions. But one hour is too late, uh, right? It's uh, so it has to be much, much faster. So one of the projects that I do in collaboration with people in Spain and Italy is that we have a dictionary. We have, uh, we do some simulations, uh, you know, by using this algorithms and using the simulations, we have a machine learning system that we train with these examples. And uh, it's, it's uh, easier said than done. There are a lot of tweaks, a lot of algorithmic improvements that go into this. And using this, we, we can make predictions. It's still ongoing work. It's not finished. But just to give you an idea, this takes now the prediction. Once the earthquake happens, our claim is that we can make a sub-second prediction. Mm. So within a second, we can, or less than a second, the early results indicate that that is going to be the case. But uh, so that's... In principle, at least that's the ambition, right? So you are able to move wow. from 3,600 seconds to half a second, which is uh, four orders of magnitude speed up, right? And this is what is necessary in many, many, many different cases, because otherwise the computational costs, particularly because you have to do it again and again and again, several things, repetitive calculations, uh, you, you need to do these kind of systems. So I think uh, uh, AI systems help in that, in that sense. So in order to get down to the half second, you need a supercomputer, you don't yes. need, you you don't don't need, need the, this, these models are the supercomputers were necessary for generating the data to do the, <laughs> to ah. do the actual physical simulations. But these huh. machine learning systems are, uh, of course, if you have them, great. But if you don't have them, you can train them on, uh, not on my laptop, but uh, relatively, I don't have to do it on the big systems in CSES. Uh, I yeah. can do it in the local cluster at ETH. Interesting. So, so it really reduces the cost considerably. Yeah. This is just one example, but there are many other examples where you get orders of magnitude speed up, and that's, that's what you want. Interesting. So someone's asked you a question, which I have no idea how to answer or even to present it in a way besides reading the question. Says, 
how math solutions and AI technologies can support building effective solutions for problems of social and food insecurity. Uh, yeah, this is uh, to some extent beyond my pay scale, right? Means uh, yeah. I know I know very little about uh, food security and food insecurity, but I believe that, uh, and it's certainly not what I what I do for a living. But I yeah. believe that certainly AI systems will have uh, because there are many things that goes into food security, right? One thing I can immediately see is land use and soil quality. And uh, telling people what sort of crops to grow where and so on, and to make predictions based on that. I think there you have a lot of data, some expert knowledge, a lot of data. And one, can, I, I, I think I have read somewhere, for instance, that there are startups in India which actually do this. They, they, the farmers to tell them what is the soil quality. And then there are AI systems which are going to tell them, okay, what sort of crops should you grow? What is the volume of crops that you are going to grow? And so on. So I think certainly AI systems can help in this in this regard. They can certainly help with better weather predictions, right? Because you need to know uh, it's not uh, the five day weather, but for instance, coming from India, it's very, very important to get the monsoon right. Uh, if you don't have the monsoon right, then uh, it's, uh, it's going to, you don't know exactly what crops to plant, when to plant them and things like that. And at the moment, uh, the, it's still a hit and miss, despite the yeah. massive progress that we have done in weather prediction, because monsoons, you know, you have to make a three-month prediction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hard. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident that with uh, there you have PDEs, right? Because the simulation is done with PDEs. And with AI, uh, you or machine learning systems, you can, for instance, better quantify uncertainties that are there, so people get a much better idea. Yeah. So there's another use, uh, another way in which you can think about food security. So I'm, I'm sure, I mean, even with my limited knowledge, I could think of two, three ways. But there are many, many other ways in which mm. one can attack the problem. Well, let me ask you another question. This is around your work in designing algorithms, mm -hmm. right? Um, do you have to come up? Like on Monday morning, you come into the office and you say, okay, today we're making a new algorithm. <laughs> and sort of like ingredients in the kitchen where you're coming up with scratch from scratch, or is it something where you are going to go, hey, we're going to make this one, we're going to tweak this one a little bit? Or... Yeah, it's again, it's a mixture of both, right? Because uh, the standard mode of operation is to tweak Right, because this is where you already have some base and then you start tweaking. But the big changes don't come by tweaking. These come by uh, really thinking out of the box. And this also happen uh, maybe not as frequently as I would like them to. One has to be lucky to find the right, uh, right thing. But uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint the exactitude of this uh, creative process, right? Because it's uh, a lot of it is sort of um, synthetic. So you try to you try to think there's some intuition, then suddenly you see a new structure and based on this new structure, you develop a little further and so on and so forth. It's never like, well, there are many Eureka moments, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not just uh, Eureka moments, you know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 it's much more, uh, let's say it's much that there, there is it's much more organic than that. It's, it's not like suddenly oh I get a brilliant idea and then it's done. No, no, it's yeah. it's, it's a gradual process. It's uh, yeah. So let me, so when you say that it's just tweaking to describe, I think of the, the, the kind of the little game of whispers where you start at one end of a a chain of people and you say a sentence, and by the <laughs> yeah. time it gets to the other end, it's completely not anything you started with right because it's a chaotic system right <laughs> so right so <laughs> but, but but when we're w w exactly with this if we think about how we're tweaking constantly tweaking 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 we'll get do you think we'll get to the point where we no under no longer understand no no this okay. is this is a, any complex system leads to this kind of emergent phenomena where accumulated result of small changes is completely different from the original 
So okay. uh, this is this is complex. This is why we are even there, right? Otherwise, evolution wouldn't work because right. uh, these are tiny, tiny, tiny mutations, and yet we have uh, so much of biological diversity. This is because of emergence. Because whenever you have a complex system and you make these small changes because of nonlinear effects and sensitive dependence to initial conditions, you will get uh, emergence of structures that are completely different. So the creative process is is very much like that. Right, but. And I like that answer because I, I like the confidence of your answer. And with, we're, quite, we're seeing a lot with AI, very often, a, 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 a con, not a confusion, but a bit of puzzlement very often on what the how, what that algorithm, what the, what the AI came, came up with. It's like scratching your head going, where in the heck did that come from? Yes, that is a, that is a very, very useful perspective to have because uh, there are things that are not completely understood about artificial intelligence algorithms means that's uh, some of the work that I do is to understand the theoretical foundations of these algorithms better but I'm the first person to say that we have just scratched the surface mm -hmm. at the moment a lot of uh, the AI algorithms is based on intuition and then deploy it and then see whether it works or not, right? So it's a bit of a hit and miss, uh, guided hit and miss uh, trial and error. It's not, not everything about it is very transparent, but this is, uh, this is how science works. Means, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people, uh, why certain things work the way they are, it takes us a long, long, long time to figure that out. Even yeah. traditional numerical algorithms, the ones that I have uh, worked with for the longest uh, period in my professional life, it takes 50 years to understand why something works. It takes 30 years to understand why something works. So you cannot expect, uh, mm. you know, things take time. It's uh, uh, applications and deployment is much faster than understanding why something works. Sometimes it's hard to understand. It's important because without understanding why something works, we don't understand the limitations. So right. I mean, on one hand, I think that's really cool. On the other hand, it kind of scares me a little bit when you say that, like, we're going to deploy it without knowing what how it really we works. We always do. Really? <laughs> we always did. It is it's a history of science. It means people come up with a cool idea, and uh, <laughs> so it's, it's I, fair. I, I, this is this is human nature. Yeah. You know, there was no understand. People had not understood every single thing about uh, nuclear fission before the bomb was built. Right? It means. Uh, <laughs> So, well, I'm not example, sure if that's a great answer. I, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Not a good example there, Sid, good example. but no, that's okay. Just, <laughs> we'll just keep just going with that one. Further, right? yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, no, no, it's, it's no. Uh, I think in science, so, you don't understand everything on the first day. Gotcha. No, I, I hear you. So which kind of leads to another question, which I find intriguing. Again, I'm not exactly sure how to answer this, which is, is there any mathematical framework available for us to understand the confidence of AI surrogate models, especially currently popular deep learning architecture? Uh, yes and no. I mean, so <laughs> okay. but there, there are models. Uh, there are, uh, there, you know, there is, a, there is a good, it's not fair to say that nothing is understood. Quite a bit of things are understood. So the mm -hmm. point is that any algorithm is going to make errors with respect to the ground truth. And these errors, they have different components. And uh, some components are better understood than other components without going into technical details. The thing, at least from my perspective, the things that are not as well understood are probably because, you know, whenever we have neural networks and we train them with uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is uh, some versions of it, the point is we are tra trying to solve an optimization problem in thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dimensions. So you have a very, very high dimensional optimization problem, but the objective that you're trying to optimize is not a convex function. So convex function is something that is a sort of, there's a, there's a basin, you know, and there is a unique minimum. That's a convex yeah. function. Hmm. Not a convex function is like the landscape of the moon. You know, there is a lot of hills and or in Utah or wherever, it means uh, lots of hills and valleys, hills and valleys, hills and valleys, small valleys, and then the next valley is even deeper and so on and so forth. So the characterization of this, and if you land in a certain valley, how well you generalize, this is... Uh, not completely understood, but there is, a, <clears throat> well, this is a mathematical question, so it can only be answered in mathematical means. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of effort by people all over the world to answer these questions. And yeah. I also put in a small effort there. 
but of course we have not understood every some some aspects are better understood than some other aspects yeah so someone has asked i think a, a very intriguing question is when we're taking a look at data from complex systems mm-hmm. can do you can machine learning results be explained like when it, when they're trained on data from complex systems so instead of using simple systems to try to train the algorithms what if you yeah yeah so it's uh, yes i would say so it depends on the degree of complexity and uh, some of the words are not very precise but uh, the systems that i usually deal with are all complex systems you know they have mm-hmm. um, the, of course, uh, you have a mathematical result which says that if the degree of complexity is larger in some sense, then it's harder to harder for the algorithm to be accurate. I mean, this is this is this is very much a fact. But uh, yes, there is some explainability. Uh, there's still a lack of inter- complete interpretability. We don't understand everything. <laughs> but uh, this is again, as I said, this is a work in progress, right? I mean, sure. I'm 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 always very optimistic that uh, yeah. we 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 don't have cast iron guarantees, but we have more guarantees than we used to five years ago. So, in principle, you know, earlier there were like the guarantees on the error, for instance, was off by three, four, five, six orders of magnitude. Today, this is maybe one order of magnitude. So people are sort of improving the the error bars considerably. So I think yeah. that there is. Uh, I'm not so much interested in sort of philosophical interpretability, being a scientist, sure. I don't care, right? Means if it's doing the job and if it's uh, accurate enough, how it does it is of little consequence to me. But indeed, it's uh, there, there are things that are not, as I said, it's because of this very, very high dimensional nature of the problem, I think, that, mm-hmm. this, uh, okay. that weird, weird things can happen. Yeah. Someone asked another question using... Um alphabets that and things i don't applied mathematicians are designing algorithms for different equations in physics have you thought about the other way around for example using ode and pde i guess that's ordinary differential equations and pds partial differential equations for the designing of algorithms for sure for sure, we do that uh, all the time. It means it's uh, also in my spotlight. I spoke about it very, very briefly. That cool. a lot of the research that I do is to use machine learning algorithms to solve ODEs and PDEs or systems governed by that. But uh, the other way around is uh, also a very active part of my research and of other people's research, uh, to say the least. And we use physical principles, physical systems, uh, physical ideas to design better machine learning algorithms. And I think I gave you an example of how we used uh, oscillators, which are physical systems, if uh, think of second order ODEs, to design better graph learning algorithms. Means a priori, mm. you'd say, well, what's the connection between an oscillator and uh, making a prediction on citations of a scientist? There's no connection a priori, but it turns out that there is a connection. We could use oscillators to build a machine graph neural network is the name of this machine learning system to better make better predictions for that purpose. And so so mm. these are, this happens a lot. There's yeah. many, many different ideas. This happens a lot that we, we, we learn from physics and then we use algorithms to do that. So I'm going to ask you, you said you're not much of a philosopher, but I'm going to ask you a slightly philosophical question, which has come in. And that is, do you believe that a could AI understand intuitive behavior? Oh, this is Ooh. really above my pay. <laughs> Ooh, I know, but I, I couldn't resist. It's kind uh, of a... Yeah, maybe I can speculate uh... As we, you and me, we all have a doctor. Uh, we are doctors of philosophy, right? So we can exactly. We're both PhDs. So, dude, <laughs> come on, piled high and deeper. Go for uh, it. <laughs> maybe, maybe not yet, because uh, the functioning of the brain is a very, very, very complicated uh, beast, right? It means it's very difficult to. I think the AI systems that we have currently do not uh, have anything to do with how the brain, they are, if at all, they have very, very sort of high level abstractions of how the brain works. 
I think the brain works in a much more shocking, I think when we discover it, it will be much more shocking to us, uh, the hmm. way it works, sort of the complex interactions that it does. And uh, we have not yet imagined what these interactions, uh, even though there's a lot of work on neuroscience, right? But nobody can sort of um, relate a brain state. No, let's say the chemicals in the brain, the firing of neurons to a brain state, to what the brain is thinking and so on. So I think there will be lots and lots of surprises there. And uh, mm-hmm. once we are that, there could be a scope for designing much, much better AI systems than mm-hmm. what we have today. What we have today is uh, limited by our imagination, right? It means it's, it's solid, but it's limited by our imagination. I yeah. think uh, the brain, uncovering how the brain works is, um, is going to be I don't think the maybe maybe there are uh, there are elements that uh, that I can see where artificial neural networks can explain some aspects of actual neural networks, mm-hmm. and they already do that. Uh, there have been many cool papers on that, but I think at the moment it's um, the other way around is going to be much more yeah. uh, spiking. You know, <laughs> I yeah, I said I have to completely agree with you. I think we're just scratching the surface and even though we keep looking at the, the physics of how it's working we haven't begun i don't think in my lifetime we'll figure that one out and uh, probably not in yours <laughs> or my kids either so and that's the beauty of being human perhaps i think that's um so i've got a couple more questions that were coming close to the end of our time because these are very interesting um what what do you think currently the most promising development in ai for solving partial differential equations. Yeah, so there are, um, yeah, this is this is a good question. It's a very specific question, so I can yeah. give uh, very specific yeah. answers. I think uh, currently there are many, many excellent ideas. You know, there are many, many different competing ideas, in some sense, complementary ideas. But uh, so at the moment, there are physics-informed neural networks where uh, neural networks are used to solve partial differential equations. This is a very promising, I have worked myself on this topic. Mm-hmm. And I think this is very prom- promising. It has its limitations as everything else. There is also something called operator learning, which is getting more and more traction, where you not only, you know, you not only learn a vector or a function, you actually learn a whole operator, which is uh, learning in infinite dimensions instead of learning in wow. infinite dimensions. Even that is, uh, that is getting a lot of traction, a lot of interesting things you can do. Uh, with that, so these are sort of the two main streams that are uh, that are at at the moment. Currently, these are the most popular frameworks, but I think uh, we haven't seen anything yet. It means uh, the next uh, couple of years, maybe two three years, we'll have much much more exciting exciting ideas. Hopefully, some of them from me, but uh, also from others in the community where we will possibly design uh, different architectures or at least, um, you know, we don't use sort of the state of the art in terms of machine learning systems, transformers and so on in a, in a efficient mm-hmm. manner to learn or maybe design bespoke architectures to solve PDEs. So I think these ideas that I just mentioned, operator learning, physics informed neural networks, this will, this will be solid. But uh, the breakthroughs will come somewhere else, means uh, mm. um, somewhere well, else. I can speculate, but maybe better not to. <laughs> well, maybe for the next talk. But I got to, yeah. you said something right at the very beginning, Sid, which caught my mind. I wrote it down that I love exploring the beauty of these structures. Yeah. Right. And so I can imagine you and I, when we look at a mathematical, Right, and algorithms see different things, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I guarantee this is this is again a very human thing. Each of us look at the world through our lens, mm-hmm. right? And this and this is a, a great thing. Now, when we look at things which are the, the virtual reality or augmented reality, and some of the new ways, and when one can, if you will, begin to get inside of buildings, inside of reactors, inside of data clouds through augmented or virtual reality. Is, is, is this something which you think could also be part of the designing of algorithms? Is- it's, it's very interesting. Uh, this I have never thought of it. Uh, the, 
converse is much easier to answer that the algorithms in particular sort of algorithms that i look at these will be very important in uh, virtual and augmented reality because they describe our physical world right and in mm-hmm. uh, right. virtual and augmented reality you have to have a surrogate for the physical world so they will have a lot of impact there absolutely that will yeah. be, be a big already i know for instance facebook and google they have huge units to do this so they they they, they do this at an industrial scale already the algorithms mm-hmm. The current algorithms are not yet at a scale where you can do this. But I, uh, it's a beautiful question that you ask. It's a very deep one, right? Because mm. I, I don't know, possibly, right? Because mm. um, if we are able to see the world in uh, more granular detail, you know, already sort of uh, sometimes I, I work on fluid flows. That's sort of the physics that I'm the most interested in. And yeah. being able to visualize things dynamically in 3D. This was not possible till very the real physical things, not what we yeah. see from Hollywood, not the graphics, you know, the real physical things. But now, you know, we we are able to do that on state-of-the-art supercomputing systems that we can actually observe uh, dynamically how certain physical systems evolve. That's already helping intuition quite a lot, hmm. you know. Hmm. Uh, so I think with uh, AR and VR, that could really help. Although I have never thought about that in. Hmm in those terms but you you are right if you can see the world uh much more eh, we are limited by our imagination i don't know if i am exactly. going to see anything new because i anyway work yeah. with formulas on pen and paper so that doesn't <laughs> yeah no we don't know i mean this is uh, i was it's just it's just popped into my mind when you said this beauty it's a very very, very yeah. good perspective to have yeah. and worth it so i have a last a sort of a last question and yeah. we're coming hopefully out of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, COVID-19 has been with us for quite a long time. Um, were there any lessons or anything that you feel we can take away on the future development of AI and computational mathematics that we learned during COVID-19? Or Well, one thing we certainly learned is that we need better epidemiological models. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, fair enough. Okay. So that's, yeah. that's the thing that, uh, you yeah. know, that... Uh, with all the credit to epidemiologists, means uh, these models that they have, the, the ones that are used today, they were developed in the 50s and 60s and so on, and these are ancient, and these don't into they, they don't go into granularity that we needed, right? They were yeah. only giving us very rough estimates on what is going to, and the uncertainties were huge. So for the very least, now, since we are in this pandemic era, we really need to invest a lot of our effort in better modeling of epidemiology. Yeah. And you have to include travel, you have to include spatial distributions, you know, PDEs have to come in because at the moment what happens is mostly ordinary differential equations. So mm. that's one thing for sure, which is, uh, and I, I know people who are trying out new ideas and uh, coming out with new models and so on. So for the next pandemic, we should have much more accurate estimates of uh, what's going to happen on a day-to-day basis, right? Which we didn't have last time, if you remember. We had a, we had a band, it was qualitatively all right, but uh, I think that's one thing which is going to, which we have to remember. The second yeah. thing on a personal note of what, what really um, the pandemic taught me is collaborating over Zoom and collaborating online it means uh, I didn't meet my graduate students for a whole year, not, yeah. a, not a single day, and we collaborated seamlessly. I could, yeah. uh, In fact, it is easier now for me to collaborate with people <clears throat> on the west coast of the US than I used to in the past because it's sure. so much better. And so I think the sort of the global community is much more integrated virtually. You know, you give a talk in China in the morning and in the west coast in the evening. So from a personal note, I think that is uh, very much enriching. So these, uh, well, these are some of the lessons that <laughs> one, I, one. I, I look forward to seeing the algorithmic model of this new behavioral pattern. <laughs> that is, <laughs> someone will do it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If, so we can apply a, it. If there is a physical phenomena, if there is a phenomena, there is a differential equation waiting to be written about it. <laughs> that's what I. That's what I'm taking away. Right. The language of math can describe anything that's moving. That and I have to say, this has been a very uh, moving uh, process in the past year. Right. So how how do we do that? <laughs> So, Sid, it has been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. There's still a few questions, but I'm afraid I'm just not going to be able to get to them right now because we need, do need to wrap this up. And it, it's been really great. I've learned a lot from you. 
And I, I really appreciate that. And, and also to Fiona and your team who uh, sort of facilitated and organized this. It, it was a real pleasure for myself. Well, thank you. And, uh, quite a few things. So thank you very much. It's a, uh, thank you. And then uh, your students are lucky to have you. I wish I would have had you 30 something years ago as my math <laughs> teacher. I really do. Okay, thank you. Very thank much. you. And thanks to all those who have joined today and to join us for this dialogue with Siddhartha Mishra, Professor of Mathematics at the ETH in Zurich. And our next live AI plus X dialogue will be with AI and self-aware infrastructure. Can I just make a little announcement? Of, if of I know, I know that there are a few questions and I would be very happy to answer these questions if someone uh, just sends them to me over email. Okay, so thank you for that offer. So those, those questions we didn't get to and Sid's email is on the, the ETH Zurich website. It's all public information. You can pop it right there. And as he said, he'll be ha very happy to answer. And the announcement for the next AI plus X um, dialogue will be uh, AI and self-aware infrastructure, infrastructure that knows its state, which is a really fascinating topic when we're looking at our mm -hmm. roads and our bridges and our buildings with Professor Eleni Khatsi. And so that is going to be super exciting. And finally, just put everyone put onto their calendars in October, there will be the AI plus X summit here in Zurich. So with that, I want to say thank all of you for participating. And thank you again, Sid, for being with me. And thanks, Fiona, for making it all easy. So, all right, everybody, stay healthy, drink lots of water, eat an apple, and wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> ciao, ciao.